Good afternoon and welcome to Southbridge's debate for the June 26, 2012 election. I'm Mike James, Chairman of the Southbridge Republican Town Committee, and this is Larry McDonald. So I'm Larry McDonald, Chairman of the Southbridge Democratic Town Committee, and on behalf of the men and women of both committees, we want to welcome you to the debate. Now today's debate up first is the school committee, and the way we have formatted this, there will be several questions asked of the candidates. Each of the questions will come randomly sealed so that there's no advanced uh, awareness of what the question is going to be until the candidate is uh, read the question. Each one of the candidates were seated, choosing a lot, uh, picking a, a number, and that's how the seating arrangement was uh, arrived at. The format for today is the first question will be asked uh, of the first candidate. They'll have two minutes to respond, and then each other qu candidate will have one minute to respond to that question, and it'll continue successively. So we're proud to bring you this event and hope you find it informative and a way to find out who the best candidate is for the two open seats of the five candidates. Thank you very much. Now our moderator will be Peter Cooper, Jr. He is a resident of Charlton, lifelong resident of Charlton, but we'll forgive him for that. Uh, he has a wife and two children, and he has a third on the way. Uh, it could be we get a phone call tonight, so hopefully that doesn't happen. Uh, he attended Shepherd Hills High School uh, for two years, and then he went to uh, Checker, or I'm sorry, to Mass Academy of Math and Science at w WPI. Uh, he went to WPI to get his bachelor's and uh, uh, master's, where he's in, com uh, in computer science. He's been for 12 years senior engineer, uh, programming engineer at Checkerboard in Boylston. He is currently the Ch town, uh, Charlton Town Moderator. He's been for three years. And uh, he participates in the Mass uh, Moderators Association. So uh, I'd like to introduce you, Peter Cooper, Jr. Thank you. And I'd like to welcome all of you. I'd like to thank the Southbridge Republican and Democratic Town Committees for hosting this event. I'd like to thank all of you who came out here or watching this at home on cable. On June 26th, the people of Southbridge will have the opportunity to select who they want as their leaders, in this case for school committee. I'm delighted to have this opportunity to moderate this discussion to understand that our voters understand our candidates' positions. Um, the candidates have been seated in a random order, and each candidate will have two minutes to introduce themselves with an opening statement before we move on to the rounds of questions. Uh, the questions were written by the host Republican and Democratic Town Committees, and candidates have not been told in advance what they are. Uh, each question is going to have a primary responder, and then they'll get two minutes to respond to that question, and each other candidate will have one minute to give their own response. And for the next question, the next candidate will go until we've gone through the round of, of questions, and then we'll move on to the next round with another random person starting first. If a candidate references another candidate during their response, then the moderator may allow for a short rebuttal from the reference candidate. Um, at the end of our rounds of questions, we'll go through as many rounds as we have time for. Candidates will be given three minutes for closing statements. Um, so we'll start out with opening statements. We'll <coughs> start out with the candidate in seat number two here, Ms. Pate. Also, I should mention that Mr. DiGregorio was not able to make it, but is a candidate. Ms. Pate, you have two minutes. Thank you. My name is Leanne Pate, and um, I'm a parent of a special needs child here in the community. And the reason I am running is my son. I'm tired of fighting with the district for services for my son that he's entitled to, as well as any of the other parents that have special needs children. I talk to them. They all have the same issues of fighting for services for their children. Um, the most part, I, I have no issue personally with any of the school committee members. I sit here and I listen to them. I don't think they have an easy job. Um, but there are things I do disagree with that they say sometimes. And I'd like to at least fight for the parents and the children in the community that need to be heard. And I'd like to do that for them. And honestly, that's basically me in a, a nutshell. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Jobin. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. First off, I'd like to thank uh, the Southbridge Democratic and Republican Town Committees for this debate tonight. Uh, tonight, you are going to have the opportunity to hear several candidates for the school committee. Uh, 
talk about the issues that face us here in the district. And there are numerous issues that, that do face us. First off, a little bit about myself. Uh, I grew up in Southbridge. My parents were from Southbridge. My grandparents uh, and their grandparents uh, before them all uh, lived here in Southbridge. I have three children, a graduate of Southbridge High School in 2005 who currently works at the hospital as a respiratory therapist. Uh, my son John, who just graduated from Selfridge High School this past Sunday, and my youngest daughter Erin, who was a sophomore here at, at the high school. My family, uh, my wife and I, have been very committed to the Selfridge School District. She served for a period of time as the uh, PTA uh, president down in the elementary schools, uh, working with those parents to try to bring a sense of community and, and getting parents engaged in the school district. Approximately 11 years ago, I sought a seat on the town council um, to try to bring uh, you know, a voice to that committee and, and ran an unsuccessful campaign, but it got my feet wet here in local politics. Uh, because I always, always believe that uh, you can't just stand on the sidelines and, and complain about what's going on. If you want solutions, you have to come to the table. I currently work as, a, as an investigator for Progressive Insurance, and I've had the tremendous honor of serving the town of Southbridge as a school committee member for the past 10 years and serving as the school committee chairman for the past seven. I think if you look at the school district and take a hard uh, look back at where we were seven years ago, uh, it's quite different district than it is now. We've had a lot of work that we've had to do and I just want to bring uh, my experience to continue on the school committee as we change the district uh, in the coming months because certainly in September the district will be a totally different school configuration than it is today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Joven. Ms. McLaughlin. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Town Democratic and Town Republican Committees for sponsoring this debate. To Mr. Jaynes and Mr. McDonald uh, for their roles. To Mr. Cooper for moderating our cable access station for televising and to the fellow candidates. I think it bodes well for public government and discourse uh, that so many people are interested in running for office this year. Um, my name is Lauren McLaughlin. I uh, have lived in Southbridge. I, re I grew up in Southbridge, but relocated here in 2001 when my twin daughters were a year old. I have um, been actively involved in the school district since they entered Helping Hands Preschool in 2004. Um, I currently work two part-time jobs. One is the facilitator of the Southbridge Family Center, which is a grant-funded program from the Massachusetts Department of Early Education and Care. And I am the outreach coordinator for the Community Health Network of Southern Worcester County. I'm actively involved in the schools, uh, participating as uh, both past PTA vice president and president. I'm on school councils. Um, I'm personally invested in the schools. My daughters now are 12 years old. Um, I am running for school committee because I believe that the reputation of the town and its schools are linked. Uh, that everybody, though they may not have a child in the school district, has a horse in this race because everybody cares about the reputation of the town and its schools. And I believe fundamental to restoring, uh, to restoring that reputation is to restore the public's trust and confidence. Uh, it's essential, essential to the future of the schools, the success of the schools, the success of the children in the schools, and the community as a whole. I hope that during this forum I'm able to address issues that are important to me, including our level four status, uh, district level turnover, uh, communication, and school choice. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Donovan. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Um, I would also like to, of course, thank the Democratic Town Committee as well as the Republican Town Committee for providing us all with the opportunity to get our voices out there and start putting um, some, some faces to the, the signs and the names that you may hear out in the community. Um, I am also a resident of Southbridge, uh, born and raised in Southbridge. My dad was a Southbridge High School science teacher. Um, my grandfather, Coco, was a police officer for over 20 years in the, in the town. I uh, graduated in 1989 from Southbridge High School, third in my class, class president. I have a bachelor's degree in liberal studies as well as a master's degree in business administration. I have served the town as a principal assessor uh, back from 1997 to 2001. 
Uh, I was principal assessor for this town and I am still currently an elected board member of the Board of Assessors. I am a mother of three children, all of which who are in the Southbridge school system. I am very actively involved in, in their educational career and I'm running first and foremost because I care and I want to ensure that not only the educational experience of my own three children, but for the children in all of the children in this community is the very best that it can be. I feel that it's time for new people with new ideas and new perspectives to arrive to the table to bring this um, district forward. And most importantly, I'm building my platform around the concept that we need to get back to our ABCs, accountability, best practices, and communication. And until these three tenants become the main driving force behind the leadership of this district, I don't foresee us being able to move forward and regain the trust the respect and the confidence that I feel this district deserves. So in a nutshell, I'm here because I care. I'm here for not only my own kids, I'm here for your kids, I'm here for our kids, and I'm in this fight to make things right. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll now move on to the first round of questions. So I'm gonna select a random one of these envelopes. person to start our debate. person in uh, C3, Mr. Joven. This question will go to you and you'll have two minutes. Do you think the school department budget is too large, just right, or not large enough? What would you change about it? Uh, <laughs> thank you for that question. Um, school budgets, uh, the school budget is always a, a, a tough uh, position to be in because we need to balance all the needs of the district, um, not only in the classroom, but our special ed department, uh, arts, music. Um, is, is it the right number? Uh, we were fortunate to, uh, in the last budget, uh, request about $23 million uh, in that budget. And the town was going to cut us $1.7 million uh, from that. Due to uh, some uh, issues that came up, uh, we were able to uh, reduce uh, that deficit. And is the number right? I believe we could always use more because class size, you'd like to reduce that. You'd like to add, uh, we lo we're looking to add uh, foreign language at the elementary school level. Unfortunately, uh, we're not able to do that. So we always are looking for more money. However, it's what we do with that money. How do we best use our budget resources that impact all of our children? And we also have to realize that we have fiscal constraints. We're not an industry that can just go out and raise money or raise revenue. We, we are a very dependent town on state aid. And when your budget makes up so much of, of state aid monies, when the state cuts uh, as they do, it's a bigger impact to our district than it is to other districts. So while we could use more, um, I believe uh, our level is at a sustainable level to do most of the things that we want to do, but we could always use more. Thank you. Thank you. Now each other candidate will have one minute to give a response of their own. Ms. McLaughlin. Uh, thank you. Um, the school budget's interesting. We are challenged in that school budget because there are certain fixed costs. There are salaries, there's special education programs, and that comprises most of the school budget. Um, there's not a whole lot of wiggle room. Um, I remember Mr. I had a conversation with Mr. Ely recently relative to something else, and he was talking about Chapter 78, as Mr. Jovan alluded to, and was telling me that um, when state aid is when state aid is cut, the school department takes a 69% hit, but when state aid comes in higher than expected, they don't get the reciprocal 70 is 69% that comes into the district. It's a challenge. We can always use more money. Who wouldn't like more money in their household budget? But the budget is what the budget is, and we have to find creative ways to get around that, including exploring grant opportunities that may be unexplored in the past. Thank you. Ms. Donovan. Thank you. Um, in my opinion, the budget is no secret or no surprise. Year after year, we set budgets. And, and I think we need to take a more proactive approach to at the beginning of the school year to know we know what our fixed costs will be, 
try to get a better plan uh, intact in, in or ahead of time than scrambling at the last minute. Um, we could always use more, but I think there's also a lot that we could do with what we have. Um, I think, again, we need to be very, very proactive. I know that Mr. Wiggins has installed a zero base budgeting technique to the school budget, which I think is a phenomenal idea to prioritize what the needs for the district will be and how to, to fund those. Um, and, you know, in the corporate business, the best way to make money isn't to lose money. And in my opinion here, the best way for us to be or utilize our budget the best way is to keep it, keep the money here for our kids, and I'm rel relating that to school choice. That's town money that should stay in the school budget for our kids. Again, our school budget is 61% of the total town, and I think it's very important that we do the best we can to keep our money here. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Pate? Thank you. Um, with the budget, I would say there's never enough money for the kids and to teach them. So to think out of the box for areas we could use help, you know, such as cafeteria if there's short staff or classrooms if they need paraprofessionals, start up a volunteer program, get the community involved. You'll have resources at your disposal with community people that can help fill in the gaps where money we're spending or we got a cut, they can use to fill in those spots, those gaps. So honestly, I, I would like to say I would like to see more money to a budget for the schools, but what they have is what they have. Um, and we need to do other resources. Thank you. Thank you. The next question will be initially responded to by Ms. McLaughlin. The elementary schools have been reconfigured into neighborhood schools again. In what ways do you think this development will be positive or negative for our system, and what new ideas do you have in that regard? Ms. McLaughlin. Thank you. Uh, in fairness, I was actually on the subcommittee with the recommendation to reconfigure these schools. I just have to say that by and large. So I was charged with investigating that, um, that possibility. Um, I don't know if that changes anything as far as the question goes, but I absolutely do support reconfiguring the schools to neighborhood schools. Um, part of the reason I support that is because I had several friends who had family, who had children in each of the five schools. And as a parent, that's a very difficult system to navigate when you have um, one report card from one school that looks different from another school. You have one set of communication guidelines and enforcement policies that's different than another school. But going forward, I'm very excited about this opportunity. I think it's going to do a lot to engage families. I think it's going to do a lot to build communities. It's going to be a little bit of a rough transition, I know, because change is always a little bit difficult. But um, it presents many opportunities for, I think, community partnerships with the schools, more intensive partnerships with, um, with parents, with community members, all of which is desperately needed to move this district forward and is actually part of our turnaround plan or had been a part of an initial turnaround plan of the district. So I think that that presents a lot of great opportunities for families in the district. Thank, Thank you. you. And now each other candidate will get one minute for a response of their own. Ms. Donovan. Um, for me, I am a huge advocate of the neighborhood schools. Uh, when I went through this school district, they were neighborhood schools, so I was very familiar with you know, how, they, how they worked. And now my own children are going through it with them being the schools that they currently are, but we are looking forward to them um, being reconfigured. For me, it wasn't a matter of if the school should be reconfigured, it was a matter of when. I think that the district has a lot on its plate and there was no set plan coming forward of how this approach was actually going to be enacted. There's no plans for pickups and drop-offs. There's no plans for what the playgrounds will be. Letters still have not gone home to parents of what schools their children will be attending. I just think it's a wonderful idea, but I think that the district has not done a well enough job for informing parents um, of where their children are going to be and how this plan will ultimately affect their families, their home lives, and ultimately the day-to-day the -day experience of their children who now have friends maybe in one school and hope to have been with those same friends, but now next year will be across town. So thank you for that. 
Thank you. <coughs> Ms. Pate? I was all for the reconfiguration. I started with Lauren on that, and then I had other issues that came up that I had to leave that committee. Um, but I'm all for the reconfiguration. I think it was a great idea. Um, I, I don't see the issue of knowing where my son's going to school. I've been at the meeting. They've presented it. They have the, the map out. They've given us plenty of information on it. Um, I think it's great for children like my son who special needs. They take a, a longer time to readjust to these schools in their settings. So this will give him that five years in that school to learn his way, feel secured with the teachers, to know they're there to help him. So I'm all for it. Okay, thank you. Uh, before we go, get going, one, uh, I was just told that there's a cell phone somewhere which is interfering with the uh, microphone and the sound setup. I might so. be this one. <laughs> thank you. Um, Mr. Joven. Uh, thank you. Uh, this uh, reconfiguration was something that we had talked about years ago when we were first looking at the concept of what do we do with the high school or the middle school. And, and on the building committee and the building needs committee, we took a systemic look at the entire district. What were we going to do? What was our school system going to look um, seven, eight, ten years from now? So part of the plan all along was to take a look at is neighborhood schools a concept that we could work with? Is it a concept, a good concept, and how do we implement that? Uh, Mr. Ely put in the plan to have the uh, groups to study that, present that to the school committee, and it uh, was reported favorably in the school committee, took it, uh, approved that process to reconfigure and go grades one through five. The benefits of grades one through five, I think, are, are, are strong. As far as communication with the district, uh, we have put out the, day, uh, the street listings, so uh, that's been publicized. If you go to what street you live on, you should be able to tell what schools you're going into from grades one through five. Um, and the superintendent will have further plans on that. Thank you. Thank you. And our next question will be initially answered by Ms. Donovan. What are your thoughts about our school superintendent actively seeking positions elsewhere? Go ahead. Well, I think everybody knows that the, um, the career of a superintendent is not to remain in one place uh, for a long period of time. How you define long period of time, um, I don't know how you do that. Um, I'm deeply saddened to see the superintendent actively uh, looking for a new job at this point. Um, I did serve on that superintendent search committee back in 2010. Um, and if you follow that or if you had a personal role in it, uh, things got a little bumpy along the way, shall we say, and I think the process in many ways became flawed. And whether that has anything to do with why our current superintendent is looking for um, a new place to go, I don't know. I think it's crucial that no matter who our superintendent is, that they be a strong leader, that they guide this district in the right direction, that they take the five-year turnaround plan that we are coming off of and move us in the direction that we need to be. We're still a level four underperforming district, and it is the ultimate role of that superintendent to get us out of that situation. Um, again, I, I, I'm deeply saddened that he is pursuing other avenues. I hope that we can convince him to make him stay. Ultimately, it's the kids that are affected by all this. And from the get-go, I think you know we need to take the politics out of everything that we're doing and focus on education. It's crucial for this district and every single child in this district that we have a strong district, that we have a district that's moving forward, and that we have leaders who are strong, who are positive, who can stand up to the state, the DESE, who can stand up to the administrators and ultimately do what's right for all of our children. Um, again, I, I wish the superintendent well in his pursuit, but I do hope that we can keep him. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Pate? Um, I, you know, whatever reason he's looking for a job, he's looking for the job, be it more money, he's just not happy here in our community, or he's not happy working with our current school committee. I don't know. I have never asked the man why he's looking for a job. Um, 
my opinion, if he's looking for a job, he's not happy, I would rather see him leave. You know, if you're currently looking that much for a job, you're not happy where you're at, then, you know, thanks for helping us and, you know, good luck is basically what I think to it. That's it. Thank you. Mr. Joven. Uh, thank you. Uh, I am deeply upset that Mr. Ely is looking for a job a year and a half into his tenure. I mean, it, there is a dynamic between a school committee and a superintendent. Uh, a superintendent shouldn't just believe that everything should be rubber stamped. Our job as school committee members is to question uh, things that he wants to put in place because what's best for our kids? What's best for our system? Doesn't mean that we disagree with them. And, and ultimately, the majority of the time, 99% of the time, the superintendents get approved uh, what they've recommended. But we have a fiscal responsibility in some of those decisions that they make. And also, like uh, Ms. Donovan alluded to, we are a level four district. So we need to vet everything they, they propose. You know, initially it was that he wanted to be closer to his family in Ohio. Well, Drake at Mass isn't closer to Ohio. So if you want to leave, then we need to find a strong educational leader and, and find somebody that wants to dedicate themselves to the town of Southbridge. Mm -hmm. uh, he's done a great job on some of the things that he's done, but if he doesn't want to be here, then let's find somebody that wants to lead this district. Thank you. And Ms. McLaughlin. Um, in my research uh, to prepare for this forum, I came across the May 2010 report, the Level 4 uh, report to the district. And one of the key topics, the hot topics in that report, was the stability of the superintendent. There was a lot of trepidation because Dr. Hanley was going to be leaving and we needed to find a new person, a strong leader to fill that role. Um, we cannot wait for the right person to do this job and to move this district forward. This level four status is a cloud that has affected the graduating classes of 2006, which would have been the first graduating class to graduate under this cloud, to the graduating class of 2024, which is the kindergarten class that entered this year under this cloud. That's 20 potential graduating classes and two generations of kids. Um, I would hope that Mr. Ely would finish out his contract in this district, um, and it is vital that we select somebody in a process that has a lot of integrity to it going forward to select somebody new to fill that void. Thank you. Thank you. And the last question from this first round will be to Ms. Pate to initially answer. Characterize the atmosphere on the current school committee. How would your presence on or re-election to the committee affect it? And how would you hope to influence that atmosphere? Characterize the atmosphere of the current committee? Yep. Uh, when I sit in the audience, I do see some members kind of make faces when other members are speaking. And the faces are faces of like, oh my god, I can't believe they said this. Um, I, I think they just need to work together. Whatever reason, they disagree personally, professionally. They need to work together and, and find the middle ground. Honestly, I would be open to listen to anyone's opinions on matters and, and argue the points with them the way I see it and they can argue the way they see it. I would find that middle ground to work with them on the points. I think out of the box a lot and, um, you know, I, I think these guys sometimes get a, an unfair shake you know, and they just need to truly work 100% together for the kids. And sometimes I think some egos get in the way of that. And, and they try to put down another member's thoughts or ideas or suggestions, and it should stop. Got to find that middle ground. And that's it. Thank you. Mr. Joven. Thank you. Uh, being on the school committee for 10 years, I've certainly seen my share of differences of opinion and egos. As chairman for the past seven years, I've had to balance a lot of those egos um, and opinions. And it's not easy being a chairman of, uh, of this group that I have up there with me. But with that being said, I want to say that you won't find a, a hotter working group of individuals that truly care about the Southbridge school system and, and our children. These are all about our kids. We care about every individual child in the system. While we may have differences of opinion, 
we do know, uh, we have thoughts of where we want to go and how we're going to get there. And, and if you take a look at the votes along the way in the last seven years, I think that you'll see that we're more on, uh, on the same page as to the votes. Sometimes it's, it's a question of, uh, of how we get there, but we, when we get there, we know we've made the right decision. So I think sometimes it's, uh, it's a tough balance, but in the end, it's all about our kids and, and striving for that excellence and trying to raise the bar. Thank you. Ms. McLaughlin. Uh, thank you. Um, sometimes I think it's tough to see the forest through the trees. Sitting in that audience of, as I have for the last um, several months uh, on a regular basis, um, it does appear that there is a lack of focus on this committee, that there are distractions um, that are taking away from the primary goal of this committee. I would like to see uh, professionalism restored in the way people conduct themselves, the way they dress, the way they act, the way they address members of the audience. Uh, I happen to notice um, a few weeks ago, Erin Clark was here from the PTA talking about a school nurse issue at the high school. Not one school committee member for an extended period of time was looking at her. And I, that said something to me. Um, and um, I think we do need to, to uh, create an atmosphere where people are welcome to come and avoid what's going on on the dais. I'd like to see the district mission statement read before every meeting. Sorry, ran out of time. Thank you. Ms. Donovan? Um, I firmly agree that there is not a person on this committee who does not have the best interests of the kids at hand. They are self, unselfishly donating their time and their energy to, to move the district forward. But as far as the atmosphere that is being exuded from the school committee, I have to also um, agree that there just appears to be a lack of professionalism. I think that as elected officials, we need to be held to a higher standard. We need to be held accountable. If we offend somebody, we need to apologize that we offend somebody. We need to treat people with respect. We want people to get involved, but if we elude or exude a bully culture where we'll let you speak, but then we're going to knock you down, I mean, there has to be respect and accountability on both sides, both from the public as well as from the school committee members themselves. Um, but we need, all need to be accountable for what we're doing, and we need to make it easier so that we can do a better job. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll now select the candidate who will be going first for the next round of questions. It will be Ms. McLaughlin. And her first question. It's regarding salaries in the school system for teachers, administrators, and all the various staff positions, do you feel that they are excessive, just about right, or are needing to be increased? Ms. Um, I have not taken a formal salary a study of, of the district. Um, I will say this in general. Education is not cheap, and by that, I mean not only within the district, but if you're pursuing a college degree, um, I just went to my 20th college reunion, and I remember the first year that I attended, uh, my tuition was $13,000. Now, if I want to send my daughters to that school, uh, that cost has increased to about $50,000. Um, so I know that the teachers that are working have all, uh, they have to have degrees, which is a significant investment on their part. I think if we want to give our children the best education, we need to pay for that. Um, again, I haven't undertaken a study of the, uh, all of the salaries in the district, but I do believe that you get what you pay for, that you work within the budget that you've been given to make that happen, and that you um, should reward people if they're doing a good job. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Donovan? Um, salaries is always a touchy subject, no matter who you talk to. Most people feel they're never, they're, uh, never get not properly getting paid for all the work that they do. Um, but there's no doubt in my mind that the teachers are the driving force behind our, our student success. And I think that they, if they deserve it, and if they are qualified, and if they have the requirements that uh, correspond to a certain and fair compensation, then I'm all for that. I personally have not studied any salary schedules. I could not tell you what one salary is of one person in the district. Um, however, I think that, again, 
the, our teachers are our greatest asset. Um, I believe that's where collective, collective bargaining comes in, that the people that are on those committees, I trust that they have the knowledge to make sure that these contracts are fair, that are equitable, that their salaries match where they should be. And if they are clear and there's no question of who deserves what, then salary should be a non-issue. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Pate? To reiterate what Lauren and Kara have said, I never studied any salaries uh, as far as teachers or anything. I've heard rumor of special needs like paraprofessionals. Our district pays the least amount. So most of them come in first year, get the experience they need, up and leave and go to the next community where they can get at least three to four dollars more an hour doing the same job. Um, so as far as salaries, teaching is a hard job, be it in a mainstream classroom, a special needs classroom, and you know, they, they should be paid their worth, to be honest. So good teachers, yeah, give them an increase. Thank you. Thanks. And Mr. Joven. Uh, thank you. Um, teachers are the backbone of our district, and I think if you look back at the school committee over the last uh, seven years ago, uh, we took a look at uh, teacher salaries. Uh, while we are not one of the higher paying school districts, I believe we are in the middle of the road. I, uh, according to the DOE website that we, we track, our average teacher salary is around $62,000 a year, which is around the state average. We, when we hire staff, administrators, uh, principals, uh, the superintendent of schools, we do a salary study to see what are other districts paying, what are their benefits. Um, same thing with the nurses. Our nurses in our school district were uh, very much under, underpaid, and several years ago we took a look at that, and we said, okay, there should be equity. We now align them with the teacher's contract for the nurses. Our custodial staff, we took a look at our town side, custodial staff, maintenance staff, and we aligned them with the uh, with the school district. So we are paying equitable salaries while we're not the highest. We are in line with other school districts. One of the issues is our health insurance plan, though. Thank you. And our next question. If I can get to it. For Ms. Donovan, how do you think our schools are being managed? And please give the voters a specific example. Ms. Donovan? That's a tough question. Um, I guess the bottom line to answer that question is, if our schools were being properly managed, we would not be a level four underperforming district. We have fabulous teachers in our school district. We have administrators who are working hard. I think that the change needs to come in the overall leadership of this district. Until accountability, best practices, and communication are better instituted in every every aspect, every opportunity, every single thing that this district works to do until those three principles are the principles that are guiding the district or the leadership of this district, I don't foresee us moving forward. Again, I credit so many people. I am in those schools all the time. Wonderful, positive things are happening at ground level on a day-to-day -day basis. However, there is still a lot to be done. We're still level four. I know we are making huge strides, but the fact is we still have huge achievement gaps in, in student success. We have new curriculums coming on board. We have, we, as a result of our turnaround plan, we've instituted some very capable people that are in charge of our curriculum, our instruction, our assessment. We have the good tools in place. It's how we're managing those tools, how those people are being used, how assessments are being done, how um, achievement is being regulated or monitored. Um, a lot of good is being done, but there's an awful lot more that still needs to be done. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Pate? Um, I honestly don't know how to answer this one. 
So um, I I just know from sitting in a couple of meetings, I've I've heard like the, the district started up some test. I heard that the principal at the high school didn't want to do it, so they didn't do it. The principal at the junior high didn't want to do it, so they didn't do it. So I don't know if I'm correct in saying you have to pay money for these tests, and then you get the principal saying, eh, we're not doing it. Who runs the show? Does the superintendent run it, or do the principals? If the school district's saying, we want you to do these tests, I want to see the principal saying, okay, we'll do these tests. Um, I, I just want to see those who are in charge being in charge and not the subordinates taking control. Yeah. Mr. Jovan? Thank you, Mr. Cooper. Uh, schools managed properly, I mean, that, that's a question that would take a lot longer than one minute to answer. Mm -hmm. I mean, I keep hearing a level four school district, and, and yes, we are a level four school district, but the definition of a level four school district, underperformance school district, is supposed to be that you are assessed at the highest level that your schools are. We have no schools that are a level four school. Okay, so the state labels the level four school district because of governance, because of uh, communication, engagement with parents. Those are all things, if you took a look at that initial level four underperformance <laughs> school district assessment that we have worked hard as a school committee to overcome. We hire a superintendent of schools that we have to hold accountable. And sometimes when we start to hold the, school com uh, the, uh, the um, superintendent accountable, it, it gets said that it's micromanagement. But we have a lot of issues that we have to address. We spend a lot of money on the administration of this school district and we need as a school committee to hold those people accountable. It's not micromanagement, it's our hard earned dollars because, because it affects all our kids, my kids and everyone else's. Thank you. And Ms. McLaughlin. I believe that very good things are happening in a lot of, uh, most of our, all of our schools actually. There are good things happening in all those schools. What we lack so desperately and I've been beating this drum now for eight years, and I'm going to continue to beat it until somebody listens, until we make some sort of change. We need cohesion. We need um, common threads. We need communication. That is going to be the way that we um, make this school district look cohesive. I'm telling you, as a parent in this district, these schools are they're hard to navigate because there's so many different individually each school may be doing a great job but they're doing it so individually that it's unlike anything their child transitions to uh, a, the year after um, it, within the two-year time frame that the kids are transitioning now again I hope that that changes with the reconfiguration but um, that's what I would argue for that um, we take the best of the things that are happening at each of these schools and we try to make them district-wide Thank you. Thank you. And our next question will be started by Ms. Pate. We are ready to open our new middle and high school. In what ways do you think this development can be used to move our school system forward? And what new ideas do you have in that regard? Can you repeat that for me? Sure. We are ready to open our new middle and high school. In what ways do you think this development can be used to move our school system forward? And what new ideas do you have in that regard? Um, from what I hear, the old high school, the old junior high are in disrepair. So kids are excited about the new school being done. Um, honestly, I don't think a new school will educate our kids. It's the people within those walls that are going to educate our children. Um, and to be perfectly honest, I can't fathom that thought of that new school being built. I would have rather seen the old schools repaired and kept in good repair. Um, that's my personal feeling. I don't know if that's a community, but that's my feeling. I just hate seeing money spent like that if we have decent buildings that could have been kept in good repair. Um, so moving the school district for it, I don't know. It, it, the teachers within those walls are gonna move these kids forward in the school district for it. Um, if they're up for that task, um, I hope they do it very well. And, and give our kids what they need inside those walls. 
um, I don't think it's going to change kids from leaving the district. If they want to go to a different school, they're going to go. Um, and mostly, that's the parents' choice to send those kids out. That new school's not going to change that choice, I don't think. And that's it. Thank you. And Mr. Joven. Thank you. Uh, it is an exciting time for the Southport School District with the new middle school, high school. However, that's not the end of the journey. I mean, we are undertaking the total reconfiguration of the district from early childhood education all the way to high school and also partnering with Quinn Sig for a community college type partnership. So while I am very excited about the middle, this new school and the 21st century skills that we'll be able to give to our students, it's just one piece of the whole puzzle. Uh, I do hope that students will stay in the district once they are at that middle school, high school, because I think they are going to have the tools up there and the resources, our technology in that building, uh, the tablets that we'll be using, the teacher skills that they will be using uh, are going to enhance greatly on our educational process. But a building isn't everything. It's what goes into it, and we have to get a better job of getting parents involved in their child's education and the children themselves valuing that education and learning the, the importance of what a high school diploma will mean. Thank you. Ms. McLaughlin. Thank you. Um, I believe the new school is an exciting thing for this district. Uh, my own daughters will be entering seventh grade next year and will benefit from that new school, which provides opportunities for collaborations in the community with institutions of higher learning. There are some new uh, vocational programs that are going into the new school that a lot of people don't know about. Um, I think it's a, it's a good opportunity. I think it should have been touted from the get-go, shouted from the rafters um, about what this means for the school because honestly the new school is only going to be new for a year or two. Then it's not a new school anymore. So what happens inside that school is of the utmost importance but also we need people to try and buy into it. Um, and again, I just it's unbelievable, but I am telling you, in the two years the school has been built, not one piece of paper has gone home to families about the new school building project. Not one. Individually, principals sent information home, but nothing from the district. Tons I could say about that. I'll Thank leave it you. there. Ms. Donovan. Well, I have been able to have the privilege of touring that new school, and let me tell you, it is a gem. It is a beautiful school, and I am very proud to say that that is in my town. And I can't thank Dr. Hanley enough and Chris Clark uh, and everybody that was on the school building committee and everybody that played a role. We are very, very fortunate to have such a beautiful school. But my opinion is that unless sustainability and education excellence is the prevailing wind up on that hill, that school will not mean anything to us. Again, like everybody has saying, it is a beautiful facility. But unless what go, it's what goes on inside that building, which that will be paramount to the success of this school district, we need strong leadership. We need high quality education. We need professional development for our teachers. We need to make sure discipline is uh, in, in place. We need to make sure that there is an environment conducive for everybody to learn so that kids can graduate, go to college, or be ready for, for their career. Again, we're so fortunate to have this in our, in our backyard. Let's make the best of it. Thank you. And then the next question, which will be for Mr. Joven. What are your hopes, plans, or ideas for the reuse of the Southbridge High and Mary Wells facilities? Mr. Joven. Thank you. As far as Mary Wells uh, goes, the school committee took a vote to return that building to the uh, town. So that, that building has already been uh, voted to go back uh, to the town side, and it will be up to the town council and town manager to de uh, develop plans for the reuse of that building. As to the existing high school, I I've heard a lot of talk throughout town that said, well, you built a brand new high school, but now you're planning on putting programs into the existing building. If it was good enough, or not good enough for a high school, why are you reusing, you reusing it for other programs? Well, the bottom line was that our accreditation for that high school was put on probation due to our building, as well as some other issues. We've been able to clear up all our issues regarding the probation status for, that high, for the high school through the accreditation team with the one sticking point of the building. So it's not 
while it's not conducive for a, a 21st century high school, there are some purposes that we can use that for. One of the things that we're looking at or, or planning on doing when the fall comes is that we have some programs that are out of district in which we spend an exorbitant amount of money to put those programs out. We are bringing those uh, special programs into that high school, uh, bringing our kids back. There are kids, they should be uh, educated in our district, and I think we can do, a, I know we can do a better job of educating them. We're also, the superintendent's office is looking to move to that existing building so that the town hall can use uh, space up here because they've outgrown some of that. We're also in partnership with some other groups in town, such as uh, Aspera is looking for uh, space, and they've contacted us to see if, if they could partner along with us, and also uh, Help Enhance program uh, may be forced to move out of their existing buildings, so we're looking at some areas within that high school uh, to put some space for them. So we are definitely looking at using that as some kind of educational center. Thank you. Ms. McLaughlin? Thank you. Um, yes, it was my understanding that the Mary Wells building was turned over to the town. I hope that the town is able to um, sell that building and gain some revenue from it uh, or to uh, use it maybe for some senior housing or something like that, being that Rite Aid is near, nearby, the hospital's nearby, the church is nearby, that might be a nice use of the building. But again, that's not the purview of the school committee to determine that. As far as the, um, the high school on, on Cole Avenue, um, I did hear, um, actually I was told by the superintendent that the administrative offices will be moving there, that um, it's actually Head Start that is looking at the building. Oh, Head Start, I'm sorry, helping thank hands. you. Head Start is looking, you're gonna cause panic. Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> it's help, thank you. It's Head Start that's looking at that facility, um, which provides an opportunity to maybe offset some of the operating costs with some rent in addition to housing some programs, some alternative programming or special ed programs in that building, which would be a, a nice use of that space. Thank you. Ms. Donovan? My uh, answer won't be anything. Uh, it'll be very similar to the last two responses you just heard. Um, again, relative to the Wells building, if it's turned over to the town, we really don't have any control of what they do with it. Um, I believe that turning it into some type of elderly center or adult uh, senior daycare ish um, where again where the pharmacy is right there it's centrally located to town that would be a wonderful use but um, what the town does with it I believe is was something for maybe the town council candidates to be concerned with um, I believe that the current school committee is doing a fabulous job with utilizing that existing high school that we have now to the best of its capacity or capability those are I think fabulous ideas we won't have to pay rent to the town anymore for the office space that we rent out here um, I do believe that that school does have a lot of great potential. Like Mr. Jovan said, it didn't meet the standards for having a new, uh, you know, a, a full-blown high school there. But there still is a lot of great potential there, and I think that all the ideas that have been put forward to utilize that space are very well thought out. Thank you. Thank you, and Ms. Pate. Um, a while back, I had sent Jack an email about the old high school, ask him what their, <coughs> excuse me, you know, what their plans were on it and I had suggested could we look into maybe creating a special needs school up there where the town can possibly generate money there's no special needs school for like autistic children within an hour and a half ride of this community I know some neighboring towns do not have special needs programs that they outsource their children to other districts so to me, that would be an opportunity to make money for our community, bringing these kids in. Um, but research would have to be done on it. So that would, I would like to see that school turned into a special needs school to generate money for us. Thank you. And we have time for one last round of four questions here. We'll start with Ms. Donovan. Donovan, Southbridge has a school system in transition. If you win or retain a seat on the committee, what do you hope to do to positively affect those changes? Ms. Donovan? Donovan? 
I'm a very positive person and I want things to be done right and I want what's best for every single child in this district. So if I were to obtain a seat on this school committee, I would stand up and fight for what I believe is right and what is just and what is in the best interest for every single child in this school district. We have so much potential to improve what's going on in our classrooms, to make our students be even higher achievers than we already are, to wipe out that stigma that comes across us because we, are, we come from Southbridge or that because our, our um, district is in a level four performance status. We need to work, I will work very hard to communicate that the perception that people have out in the community about our schools is not in fact the reality. There are fabulous things taking place within the walls of those schools. It's just not getting out there. We need to do a much better job of aggressively communicating and relating to the public that these schools are fabulous places for our children to be in. And I will fight that to the end to make sure that the perception of our schools can catch up with the reality of our schools. There's a lot for the people to learn that we have great families, great teachers, both inside and outside of the classroom that care, that want to be there. We're a melting pot community. We come from all different walks of life, all different levels of, of wealth and status. But the thing is, you know, we're there. We're all one. We're, we're together. And there's no reason why we can't move forward all together. So I will remain as positive as I possibly can. I will fight for what's right. I will stand up for what's right. And I will hope to make, do everything I can to make a difference, not only in the education of a ch life in the child, or not only education um, in the children of this district, but in the life of the children in this district. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Pate? Can I have you repeat that for me? Certainly. Southbridge has a school system in transition. If you win or retain a seat on the committee, what do you hope to do to positively affect those changes? Um, the only thing I think I could do is to, you know, listen to the parents and try to get their views across to fellow school committee members to see it their way. Um, if, if I had to go stand in a classroom all day and help the teacher, I would. I don't care. I'm here to help the school district in any way I can. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. The transitions, they happen daily, and you just have to roll with it, and that's basically what I would do, is roll with it. Thank them. you. Mr. Joven, thank you. Uh, as a chairman of the school committee for the last seven years, uh, you know I've provided leadership in regards to this transition, how we've evolved uh, into the system that we are today. And uh, Ms. Donovan's absolutely right; the perception is not the reality. Uh, I don't have the luxury of going into the elementary schools or the middle schools as much as I'd like to, but I am in that high school. And the perception of that high school is that it's a zoo and that there's no le learning going on and that our kids are not engaged. And I have to say that is that is wrong. Um, if you took a look at this year's graduation and the uh, program for that, the schools that our kids have been accepted to um, is, is exemplary. Uh, I would provide the same leadership uh, through this transition as we evolve into a uh, educational model and hopefully a model for the state as we move forward in our turnaround plan. Thank, Thank you. you. Ms. McLaughlin. Um, it was recently stated at a school committee meeting that this board, the school committee, has two charges, and them be, those two being um, budget and uh, policy. There are actually five charges of the school committee. There's the policy making charge, the appraisal or evaluation of those policies, the budget, the public relations aspect, and educational planning and evaluation. Um, I would work my darndest to make sure I had a grip on all of those. I would uh, establish immediately a communication subcommittee, a special subcommittee geared towards communication. Um, you can have the greatest systems in place in the world if those are not effectively communicated to people and need to be communicated actively, not passively. It's not good enough to have something up 
uh, on a website sometimes. It's not good enough to rely on the local newspaper. I remember Mrs. Poirier in high school saying, with, when we learned about Shakespeare, said you have to say things five times, five different ways, so the people in the back of the room get what was said in the front of the room. I'd work on that. Thank you. And our next question will be started by Ms. Pate. Please rate the overall quality of education in Southbridge and then comment upon it. Grade the overall quality? The overall quality of education in Southbridge. I can grade it either way. I just had my niece graduate from the high school along with Mr. Jovan's son, and she graduated honors. So can I say it's awesome? Sure. I see my niece graduating honors, got accepted to a good college. I see my son, who's not getting anywhere in the school district because special needs doesn't want to put out the services for him. So you can grade it either way. It's all in the eyes of the beholder. So special needs, I give them an F. Other kids, I'd give them a passing grade. Kids want to learn what they want to learn. You could have the best teacher stand in that classroom and there's going to be a kid that's going to fail because he doesn't want to be there. So I would give them passing grade on mainstream. As special ed, no, they fail 100% in my eyes. Thank you. Mr. Joven? I think we do, I, I know we do a very good job about the quality of our education in our school system. We have high quality teachers. Um, maybe some services aren't rendered to all the children. And that's a, a problem that needs to be addressed through the superintendent's office. Um, and then ultimately to the school committee. I know um, our kids can succeed. They are given the tools uh, and the resources. Are there some issues? Yeah, absolutely there are some issues. A lot of this also stems um, from the social economic status of some of our kids. They don't have the, the, the structure at home and they come to our schools looking for that guidance and direction and our teachers have to do a tremendously tough job of balancing all their needs for all kids. But overall, I believe the quality of our education is second to none in the area. Um, we do have to do a better job of uh, praising uh, the accomplishments of our students and uh, sometimes we lose sight of that because as a school committee member, we're in the trenches dealing with all the other issues as well. Thank you. Ms. Thank McLaughlin? You. Um, education is a partnership. It's a partnership that requires uh, the teachers, the parents, the community, um, the police, the faith-based. Um, we need to do a better job of engaging those people. I think a lot of education is self-determined. Some kids are naturally more curious than others. Um, but everybody has an equal opportunity to learn here, uh, and it's how to use those partnerships with the families, with the community, to draw the very best out of the kids. Um, my children have had a great experience here. I wouldn't still be here if they didn't have a great experience here. Um, I think that the, the school choice numbers show that there's a lack of confidence in the educational system here. Again, perception versus reality, but I will tell you that advocating for these schools has gotten consistently harder over the years. Um, I used to address parents of preschool children and they would say things like, mm, the elementary schools are good but not the middle high school. We have a lot of kids choosing out in elementary school now. Sorry. Thank you. And Ms. Donovan? While mediocre, I believe that the education of this school system deserves to be so much better. I am a graduate of Selfridge High School. I came through the town. I came through the education system. Um, I don't know why it has to be so hard now to try to convince people why we have to stay. Um, when I say mediocre, I, I, I don't want to discount all the tremendous work that is going on in the classroom, the huge strides that we've made. But the fact is, you know, we still have huge achievement gaps that need to be filled. We still have a graduation rate that is 
a lot higher or a lot lower than the state average. We have a dropout rate that's a lot higher than the state average. We need to do a better job to set a course for our students from day one as soon as they enter and set an academic course for them that they can carry with them their whole entire career here to make them want to learn, to be a part of a school system that cares for them and make them want to be here and have it be something they want to pursue rather than something they have to do. Thank you. Next question will be started by Mr. Joven. The school cafeteria's express line is gone. It earned about $500 per day. Would you seek to restore it? Mr. Joven? Um, that uh, school cafeteria issue came up to the school committee, and I know it caused a lot of angst in the community. We have federal guidelines that we have to follow as far as what we provide to our students. And it was told to us through the federal program that the way we had this express line uh, wasn't equitable to all children. And, and I, I agree, if it's not equitable to all children, then we need to take a look at it and change it. Uh, and how do we do that? I think that the school's the superintendent and the food service could have done a better job of educating the school committee prior to just abandoning the program so that we could pass those messages on. And, and that's one of the things that we strive uh, difficulty with is the communication. The school district also on a breakfast program went and took uh, breakfast and changed the way, uh, the, the things that kids got at high school with no conversation with, with uh, up through the committee or down to the kids. And they just throw it upon them and the kids don't know what's going on and, and we didn't do a good job of communicating that. And the new school is a whole new setup on the way that kids will be able to uh, get their, uh, their food. I have heard some, a lot of positive things about what went on in the high school now. I think that they've been able to provide some good choices. I, I know my own daughter has come home with some of the salads that they have and there's excitement about the nutritional quality. So I, I think while the, the idea of the express line and the change of it uh, should have been communicated better to the committee and the school district. Uh, I believe that this, uh, some of the comments that were said were un unfortunate comments. I'm not going to comment for what another member says because uh, we will do what's right. Um, and I think in the new school, uh, the cafeteria, the way it's set up, uh, I think they will have better success. But I don't believe that we're going to have a financial impact because of a change in an express line. Um, let's provide quality food for all kids. Thank you. Ms. McLaughlin. That was my confusion when the whole issue came up about uh, losing money. My understanding of it was that there were two lines at the school, and the way the state or the federal government came in and, and reviewed it, it appeared to be the haves versus the have-nots. The kids that could pay for lunch out of pocket um, went through one line that was deemed the express line, the fast line, and everybody else went through a second line. Um, you know, I can certainly see why the state would have concerns or issues about that. Um, sometimes doing what right, what's right costs money, but in this case, I don't think there should be a, too much of a financial impact because ultimately it just means children are going into one line. They could have two of the same lines. They could have two of the, the same lines, um, and, and it would still speed up the line. So that was very confusing to me. Um, Ultimately, our children are equals in the school district. They need to be treated equally and fairly, and they need to know that the district looks at them equally and fairly. Thank you. Ms. Donovan? I do not have a whole lot of personal experience relative to this issue. I do not work in the cafeteria at the high school, nor do my children attend the, the high school. So I, I don't know what the day-to-day -day experience is in the, in the school cafeteria. But I did see that uh, particular school committee meeting, so I am aware of what transpired. Um, I guess the bottom line is if the federal government or the state uh, mandates that we can no longer have that line, then we have to accept that for basically what it is. And I believe that as a result, um, I completely agree with Mr. Jovan that it just was improperly communicated down the whole line. And when things aren't communicated properly, I think that's where frustration and anger can set in. And it's just as frustrating for people serving on the school committee as it is for the people that are out in the, in the community getting the information. However, I guess the bottom line is that regardless of how frustrated you are, uh, if you are 
sitting at this table, you need to be held to a higher standard. Be careful of what you say. Be careful how you say it. And if you do offend somebody, take accountability for it and apologize. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Pate? I don't think I would restore the express line. It's, it's a state and federal law that you can't separate the lines. So the district was correct in stopping it. it you can't just go violate in state and federal laws when it's coming to the, the rights of the children or the community. And if it can affect their funding or their being penalized, then no, just eliminate it and you know, just move on to the next real issue of, you know, getting the school running. I mean, express lunch, come on. Bring your lunch from home. Thank you. And our final question this evening will be started by Ms. McLaughlin. What is your philosophy regarding school choice and the way it has worked out in the Southbridge school system? I just hit the question lottery. So excited. I have so much to say about school choice. Well, you have two minutes. Okay, I'll fit it in. Um, this town, in the last seven years, has spent a staggering amount on school choice. $5,483,595. And I say in the last seven years, that's the number of years my children have been in the school district. The majority of that money, however, has been paid out in the last five years. Um, the year my children entered kindergarten, that figure was $168,000. This year, uh, according to the DESE, that figure is $1,049,903. I don't like school choice. I think it pits one district against another. But the other districts are winning. And how they're winning is that we are not communicating to parents. We are not letting them know what this community has to offer, what the schools have to offer. That $1 million is a direct, no confidence vote in the district that I don't believe that you can educate my child the way that other districts can educate my child. Um, this is money that all along the line could have restored, uh, restored staff programming um, in the schools. I have not seen in my time that I've been involved with the schools any concerted effort to reverse this trend, any concerted effort to uh, find the underlying causes of it. Although again, what, people may leave for individual reasons, but the connecting thread is that basically it's a no confidence vote. For the voters of Southbridge, who are expressing moral outrage over $250 trash fines. That $5 million figure is the equivalent of 21,934 trash fines. We should be outraged. This is a major problem. That money belongs in this district. It belongs to this town. It belongs to the kids. It belongs to the schools. And it has gone <coughs> up in Thank seven you. years. Thank you. Ms. Donovan. I am definitely not a uh, advocate for school choice for m very many of the similar reasons that Mrs. Uh, McLaughlin has, has stated. The bottom line is we're losing money and it, again, people have lost confidence, they've lost trust, they've lost respect for the school district and a lot of that is based on perception like I said before, we need to change that perception. But how long is it going to continue? That's money we need here. I mean, our, why are we paying our tax dollars to educate our kids somewhere else? It just doesn't make sense to me. And I think we have to make this our number one priority. What are we going to do better to make these families stay? We need to bring in accountability, best practices, communication. We need to reach out to all stakeholders, engage everybody in this community, anybody that has a role here, to bring this community back to where it needs to be, to get our, our, our district back on track. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Pate. I don't know, maybe I'll sound like I'm going against these guys. I personally like school choice as, as far as like Bay Path. They, they're a vocational school. There's some trades they teach that you don't need college degrees for. So these kids can go to that school knowing that maybe I'm not cut out for college, but 
man, I love to work on cars, or man, I like to build cabinets and, and work with wood. Those are great skills for these kids, trades. So I'm for like vocational schools. I would love to see the kids back in the community. I know some of the kids did come back senior year. I've seen, seen a few of them come back from Bay Path and Tantasqua. They just came back. They wanted to graduate from Southbridge. So the kids will choose. And the parents are the, ultimately the ones we have to convince to keep them here. Thank you. Mr. Joven. Uh, thank you. Uh, school choice has been a thorn in my side for a long time. I've been talking about school choice for four, five, six years about what we're going to do about it, how we're going to identify kids that have been left the district. I had conversations with two superintendents to say, hey, we need to address this problem. And unfortunately, it always seems to get to the back burner. But you're right, it is a lot of money. Uh, why do kids leave this district? I, I know that we can do a better job of educating our own kids. There are kids they should stay in this community. We have a lot of kids that went over to Quaybock. Take a look at the cherry sheet in Quaybock. Quaybock spent in the last year $583,000 of income and money and lost $487,000. So our kids are making up for kids that left their own district. Um, we need to identify those kids and the building isn't going to change it. I don't think we're going to get kids to come back by building a new building, but I do believe that we will stem the tide once we get kids into that middle school and see the programs that we do have offer at that high school. There are great things going on at that, that high school and kids can succeed and the, you're absolutely right, the uh, perception is not the reality of what goes on in that high school and in this district. Thank you. We'll now move on to closing statements. Each candidate will have three minutes to give their closing remarks and we'll be starting with Ms. Pate. Ms. Payne? I'd like to thank you for inviting me to come here today. And um, honestly, it, we need to change the, the appearance of the district with the parents. Ultimately, it's the parents who would choose if they want to stay in our community, if they want to send our kids to our districts. We need to reach out to the parents and say, what are we doing wrong? Parents need to come and sit in that audience every day when they have their meetings and if you need to stand at the mic and say hey I can't stand you guys then do that if you think they're doing a great job say you're doing a great job there's no involvement we got to get the community involved in this you know we got to fight for these kids collectively as a village and say these are our kids these are the kids that are going to run our future eventually I want to make sure they're all well educated because I've seen some politicians that aren't that great. Um, so ultimately, these guys don't have an easy job. Some people ask me if I'm crazy for doing this. I don't know, maybe I am. Maybe I'm just in, I'm vested in my son getting what he needs to succeed so as he grows up, he doesn't have to live a life on disability. Ultimately, if I invest some money in my son's education and get him to where he needs to be, he might be able to go get a job when he gets out of school instead of having to go to Social Security because he still can't talk. That's not right. These kids need everything we can give them. I don't care if I got to reach in my pocket and give a kid five bucks for lunch. I would do it for that kid if that kid truly needs it. We have to help them. You know, and like I said, these guys do get a lot of gruff, and I give Jack some credit for having some real thick skin, because some stuff you hear about these guys is just mean, you know, and I don't want to point the finger, because they really, truly do have a horrible job in decision-making on things, and knowing that half the community is going to disagree in one way or the other. Um, I just want to be afforded the chance to show that I will fight for the kids, and be it, if I got to stand here and keep saying no, 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 I'll do that. And someone will throw a shoe at me on the committee. I'll guarantee you. Um, but, you know, bottom line is I care about my son. I care about listening to the stories of other parents that deal with the same stuff I do and seeing tears in their eyes when they're saying they got to fight with the district that say their kids out of district and they won't bring them back because they can't handle their child. That's wrong. You know, we need to figure out a way to help these kids. Thank you. 
Mr. Joven. Thank you. Uh, first off, I want to again thank the Selfridge Republican and Democratic committees for this debate. Um, while I think that we could have used a lot more time in ex explaining our positions to certain questions, because obviously a one-minute response is very tough to be uh, talk about all the responses that we have. Uh, Mr. Cooper, thank you for moderating this. Uh, the uh, Town of Challenge is lucky to have you as its moderator, I can see. But the bottom line is this. You're going to have face a choice when you go to the polls in a couple of weeks uh, to choose two candidates out of five. Um, all these candidates are equally qualified to represent you, uh, the voters of Southbridge, um, and do a great job. I think we all have the same goal in mind, and that is to provide quality education for all our children. Our kids all go here. We, all, we grew up in Southbridge. I mean, we are all graduates of Southbridge High School. I was, I'm a little bit older. I'm the graduate of 1980, so I'll be the elder, elder guy here. But uh, bottom line is we spend a lot of money on education, and what do we do with those, uh, those dollars? Uh, Ms. Donovan's absolutely right. Accountability. We need to hold our leaders accountable. And it's tough being on the school committee when you start to hold people accountable. They get upset. They start to go look at other jobs. But that's our job as elected leaders. We have a $20 million plus dollar budget, not including grants and entitlements, that we oversee. And how do we spend those dollars? School choice, a big nut to crack. I know that I've advocated for this Southbridge school system and gone out in other communities and, and praised Southbridge, but like Ms. McLaughlin said, it, it's tough. It's tough to go out there and hear as a Southbridge High graduate, hear people talk about why would you go to Southbridge High School, why would you go to Southbridge Public Schools, and teachers to be told why do you teach in Southbridge, but we have great teachers. If you take a look at where we were seven years ago with the tremendous turn, turnover of teachers, I mean, there wasn't a meeting that went by that we didn't have four or five teachers that were resigning at a clip all the time. If you take a look at the stability that we have in our district on the teaching staff levels, the teaching staff uh, has been stable. We have a great high school staff, elementary staff, and we have some very good principals. I wouldn't want to be a principal or a superintendent in a school. I wouldn't want to wish that on anybody because the accountability that goes with the state, the reports, the mandates, and the pressure on teachers and staff to push kids and, and make AYP and MCAS and Common Core standards, and we're changing standards every day, it's a, it's a tough job. This has been a challenge for 10 years being on the school committee and an equally bigger challenge to be the chairman of this committee. I'm proud of all the work that we've done as a school committee. Is there more that needs to be done? Absolutely. Um, and I, I'm just asking you, the voters of Selfridge, to bring me back for a, another term as we continue the transition to improve and strive for excellence and putting kids first, because that's what it's all about, is putting our children first. They are the future, and education, with education, you can change the world. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. McLaughlin. Thank you. Once again, I'd like to thank everybody involved for this opportunity to be here and speak. Uh, boy, does this time go by fast, much faster than I anticipated. I have notes, I have cards, I wasn't able to talk about things. Um, but I want to let everybody know that I actually do have a website, and on that website um, I have some uh, position statements, if you will. Uh, the website is www.voteforlauren.com, the number four, lauren.com. I would encourage people to visit that site and to submit questions to me directly. If they have questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, I believe, as I've said before, that the reputation of this town and our schools is linked. One will not be improved without the other. There's a symbiosis here. I also believe that what we're fighting against is a district that's hermetically sealed, that it is very hard to, to get in and make a difference from the outside. I'm looking to make a difference from the inside, maybe poke a few holes. Um, sure, some bugs might come in, but you got to get to the fresh air, right? Um, the new school is an exciting opportunity, but I think we've all known people that have built beautiful houses and had lousy marriages. It's what's happening inside that school that's going to matter. It's maxi maximizing the taxpayer's investment by providing a good quality education in that school that's going to matter. Um, just as a point of information, uh, just so for the voters, um, the Bay Path students, their money does not come out of school choice. No. It's a separate line okay. item. I just wanted to let you know that. Um, so school choice is actually 
families that I've just decided enough is enough, I'm out of here. And unfortunately, once that school choice takes hold, if I'm school choicing my child out and I'm having a pretty good experience in another district, I'm going to tell my friends and they're going to tell their friends and so on and so on, like the shampoo mm -hmm. commercial. So we have to combat that by um, letting people know why they should stay in district. And it, 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 there's, there's so much. There's so much to talk about here. The new school, great, great, great. Children were not involved in that process in the least. They were not invited to the groundbreaking of that school. Um, they have not been involved in anything. I think it's hard to make those kind of decisions and try to make an impact when you don't have a buy-in from the people, the very people that you're trying to impact change for. And until we can master that, that lesson is going to keep throwing itself in our faces because life will give you the same lesson over and over again until you learn from it. That's the challenge here. That's something I think I can make a difference in. I hope the voters of Southbridge give me an opportunity. Um, I think new voices are needed on the committee. Sometimes if you, there's a hole in the rug and you've been walking by the hole in the rug for four years, you don't see it. Sometimes it takes a new person to walk by and say, hey, you got a hole in the rug. We got to fix that. And I appreciate it. I think lastly, I just want to say my daughter Katie's in a soccer tournament today. I'm missing it to be here with all of you. I wish you luck, Katie, and all the teams that are playing. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Donovan. Thank you very much. Um, I'd first like to also uh, give my thanks to both the Democratic and the Republican town committees for allowing this forum to take place. Um, to Mr. Cooper, for taking time out of your busy family schedule to be here for all of us today. Um, this has just been quite a humbling experience for me. This is my first time out of, uh, out of the gate, so to speak. Um, but I've learned so much, and I, I feel better and better every time I speak to somebody or I get a call supporting me. Um, I think that all the reasons why I'm running for this campaign are for all the right reasons, and with each growing day, I'm more confident in my, my, my choice for running. Um, I'm a qualified candidate. I'm a competent candidate. Um, I have no hidden agenda. I'm simply coming because I care. I'm here for my own kids, but I'm here for every other child in this district as well. I want to see our school district move in the right direction. Change is in the air. There's a lot of things that are happening around us. And change can be a very good thing. It can be very, very difficult, but it also can be a very positive, wonderful thing. And I want to be part of that wonderful thing. I want to offer solutions, practical solutions, be a new, a new set of eyes to uh, what's taking place, a new, bring, a, bring new perspective to what has been taking uh, place, bring a new way of doing things. Um, sometimes I think when you've done something for so long, you can't see the forest through the trees. So you need that new perspective to bring things out that may not be brought to the forefront. Um, the other thing is I, I just want people to know that I'm not here just because. I'm here because. I care because I'm here, because I want every single child in this school district to have the best educational experience that they could possibly have in this district. I want them to get a 21st century education so they can enter our 21st century world and be competent and get good jobs or go to college or be able to raise a family. I so sympathize with Ms. Pate. You know, I grew up in a family where both my father and my sister were in wheelchairs. My sister had tremendous struggles in this school district, had to go to Burgess Elementary School for the sixth grade because there wasn't an elevator or a ramp at the middle school. I can sympathize and I can empathize. It is not easy to be a parent or a student in this district, but you have to take the good that's around you and move forward. No man is an island. We can't expect me alone to uh, accomplish everything that's in front of us, nor can we expect the seven people who ultimately sit at this table to accomplish everything that needs to accomplish. But the key is we need to be accountable for what we do. I will, if you ask, if I am fortunate enough to receive your vote, I will hold others accountable as I will expect to be held accountable myself. I will do what's right. I will follow the best practices. I will ensure communication in everything I do. And I promise you, that I will do the very best that I can do with integrity. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank all the candidates who are coming out here and for being willing to serve their community. I'd like to again thank the uh, Southbridge Republican and Democratic Town Committees for hosting this event and for all the people who are here watching or watching on cable. Uh, it's really important that everybody gets out and votes on June 26th. You get to select two out of the five candidates.
Um, and now I don't know if there's closing remarks from Mr. James and Mr. McDonald. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. I'd like to thank everybody for coming and for those who are watching. I'd really like to thank uh, Peter Cooper for showing up, the volunteers who have helped out, Bob Chernensky, Bob Cantera, Tommy Ayel, and John McHugh. Uh, this has been uh, a lot of fun working with the Democrats here. Uh, surprisingly, we got along pretty well. Uh, and there's going to be the next debate coming up uh, in a few minutes here. Did you want to say anything, Larry? I don't think you covered it all, but I do think we do need to thank our candidates uh, who did show up and for your time and for your well thought out responses to the questions. Thank you for being here. Thank you to the audience for watching. Thank you to the public.